that's embarrassing. I didn't know you were watching. I was just doing my daily hand stretches and arm warm-ups for all of my viewers who are deaf and speak in sign language so that you can understand me. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking. I know I use my hands way too much. Thank you for all the new viewers and subscribers who pointed that out to me. Really appreciate it. I will do my best to continue to use my hands as much as possible because I know it's not distracting at all. But really thank you all who are my new subscribers here who saw my last video. And I really wanna give a special shout out to those of you who have been around with me since the beginning. Tony, Matias, Carlos, you guys know who you are. Really appreciate it, it means the world to me. Thank you all for watching, liking, subscribing, helping me get this information out to the world. If you're new to the channel, this is Heresy Financial. And this is where we talk about financial topics in a way that is uh, considered heresy to the financial establishment. Today we are going to be discussing the six driving factors of the next decade. As we turn the corner on a new decade, we're going to see some big influencing factors that are going to be the driving force behind a lot of change that's gonna happen in this decade versus the last decade. And so today we're gonna dive into some of those influencing forces that are gonna be driving the next 10 years, what they look like and what influence they will have on the market the economies, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and the global markets. If you are impatient, I'm gonna list the six out for you right now and then we'll dive into each one for the rest of the video. The first one is the ineffectiveness of global central banks. The second influencing factor is gonna be the wealth gap growing and the polarization of politics. The third one is going to be the dynamic of China being a growing and rising power challenging America as the ruling reigning power. The fourth one is going to be an exodus of money out of assets to fund growing obligations, both private and public. The fifth one is going to be a negative return on both cash and bonds. And the sixth one is going to be a rush into hard physical assets with intrinsic value, potentially things like commodities, precious metals, and real estate. Let's dive in. Thank you so much for tuning in with me today. Like I said in the intro, we are gonna be going over the six main driving factors that are going to be influencing the next decade. A couple disclaimers before I start. Number one, most of the information here is a summary of information that's put out by Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater Associates, the largest hedge fund in the world. Number two, almost all of what I'm going to be saying in this video is predictive not prescriptive. So I'm saying these are the things I think are going to happen. I'm not saying these are the things I think should happen. There's a big difference. They get miscommunicated a lot. So I wanna be very clear. I'm not saying these things should happen. I'm saying they probably will happen. Third, this is not individual financial or investment advice. I'm not making any specific recommendations for any specific individual out there to make any investing decision for themselves. This is purely educational. And lastly, if you stick around to the end, I'm gonna be answering a few questions that popped up a lot in the comments section of my last video on the soon to come repo market crisis that's gonna culminate at the end of this year. So if you wanna hear me answer the most common questions that I got in the comments on that video, stick around to the end and we'll go over some of those. All right, let's go. The number one influencing factor that's gonna be driving decisions and markets in the next decade is almost certainly going to be the ineffectiveness of central banks. Now, the reason why I say this is because you usually see over a long period of history that decades rarely look the same as the decade that they preceded. So if you look at 100 year time periods of history, especially inside of countries, Usually you'll see decades marked by specific economic factors and certain asset classes doing well and others doing poor. And policy, whether it's by the central bank or by the government, having an effect in one way or another. This decade that we're about to enter into, the 20s, looks like it probably will be very similar to the decade of the 1930s following the stock market collapse of 1929. And what I mean by that is there was great excess and malinvestment and speculation caused by the Federal Reserve, which started in 1913 and only took 16 years for that to result in the greatest financial crisis the globe had ever seen. And I know I'm in the minority on this opinion, but it was really the Federal Federal Reserve that caused the Great Depression and it wasn't business. They gave the fuel to the fire. And so what you saw after that was that the Federal Reserve was pretty powerless to really do anything about the following decade because of the tools that the central banks naturally have. And if we look back at the last decade, central banks have been extremely proactive in printing money, pushing down yields, and monetizing their government debt. What this has resulted in over the past decade is massive stimulus, and we've seen a huge 
fantastic historic rise in asset prices. We've had the greatest expansion in terms of time in history, and that's largely due to the amount of stimulus that central banks around the world have been shoving into the economy. And so what we're likely to see is the effect of central banks die off because we've already basically experienced the peak of how much influence that they can have. Now, the main reason why central banks are likely to be ineffective in the uh, coming decade is for two reasons, which are the next two points. The first reason is because of the growing wealth gap and political polarization. And the second reason is an exodus out of assets in order to fund obligations. I talked about the wealth gap in my prior video on student loans and the student loan crisis that we're facing. But really what we're seeing is a massive and growing and quickening gap between the haves and the have-nots. Historically, that is a recipe for revolution, public or civil unrest, and motivation to politicians to do something about it. Now, you and I both know that a lot of the problems in the wealth gap itself is primarily caused by improper policy or I should say an overreach of policy and the central banks. Because if you want to simplify it, the central banks print money and they lower interest rate. That makes money really easy to get for those who are credit worthy. Really, the ones who are the most credit worthy are going to be the large corporations. And so they borrow money that's basically interest free. Now, because of an economic slowdown or trade wars or global tensions, the safest thing that they can do with it to satisfy shareholders is to buy their stock back. And so that's why you see here, you've seen a massive increase in corporate debt, just an explosion of corporate debt and you've seen a stagnation in corporate profits and earnings. What that looks like is that the main cause of the stock market rise over the last couple of years has primarily just been due to the amount of money that the Federal Reserve has been printing. And then that stock that's purchased is used to fund salaries of especially the high level CEOs or other officers of companies. And even just wealthy investors who have a lot of stock, this is obviously gonna influence their overall wealth. But by the time that those shares are sold, that money is spent and it works its way down through the economy in the trickle down effect, it has already bid up prices so much that by the time the new money reaches those who need it most, the cost of living has already moved past where those people who need it most were at before. And you see this causing a massive polarization politically. Now, the number one argument to the wealth gap and the complaints by young people that say, oh, you know, I'm so loaded down with student debt and I can't get ahead and I can't make any money. The number one objection to that is don't complain about your standard of living. Your standard of living is way better than anything I had growing up or anything that any of your ancestors had growing up. Now, that might be true, especially when you factor in technology, but an increase in standard of living has happened despite everything that is happening economically and politically, not because of it. And that's a very important distinction to make because if you think it's happened because of it, well, then you're gonna to continue to try and do what you've already been doing and that's gonna be ineffective and cause even more harm long run. But if you realize that it's happened despite, then maybe we can make some changes to our actions moving forward. Now, the second reason why central bank action is likely to be very ineffective in the next decade is because it looks like we're going to have to have an exodus of money out of assets in order to fund obligations. Now, one of the fundamental laws of money is that you can only spend what you will ever make. And so if you spend more now through the use of debt, you're going to have to pay that back at some point. And if you don't pay it back because there's some sort of debt forgiveness, that doesn't just wipe it away. That just transfers that obligation or that risk or the consequence of that to the overall system or the public. We're also seeing a massive spike in obligations to the federal government through things like Medicare and Social Security. With conservative returns not being what they were always expected to be, pensions are under a lot of weight in order to produce the type of returns that are expected out of them. And so they're getting more and more into riskier and more aggressive investments. Now, as the economy starts to roll over, we're going to see an increase, most likely, in the wealth gap in this political polarization. And what that means is that as we have a recession and as things get a little bit harder, it is very, very, very likely that we have politicians in power who maybe it's out of the goodness of their heart and maybe they are well-intentioned, but they want to do something about the wealth gap and the economic crisis. And so they start to implement policies and actions and decisions that lean a lot more towards the welfare state. Now, this is a pattern that repeats itself over and over again throughout history and throughout countries. This is usually what politicians do. Because quite frankly, if it's a decision between total revolution, riots, and mass chaos versus slowly deteriorating your economic strength and implementing more and more social and welfare policies, you're probably, as a politician, going to choose the latter because it's going to be more popular. 
So we're likely to see things like this go into place. One of these things could be Medicare for all. Another could be an expansion or an increase in social security. Another could be universal basic income. Another could be total student loan forgiveness. And so as economic hardships increase for the masses and the majority of the population, while at the same time, people who have the ability to access credit and hold assets are getting richer, you're likely to see much more pressure on our governments to support these types of welfare spending plans. And the rationale behind it from an emotional standpoint makes sense. We've had central banks that have created and funded the rich for decades. So why not use central banks in order to help out the little guy? Now I'm not gonna go into this now because obviously as you can tell, I don't think that it works. While it appeals to the emotions and might keep the public at bay and chaos at a reasonable level, I don't think it's an economic policy that actually will help out the country in the long run. But the reasons why are a topic for another video. All that to say, all of these new obligations that are likely to get put in place are probably going to lead to a massive expansion of expenses at a time where our deficits and our spending are already increasing at record levels. And the only way to fund this is going to be through central bank printing. And the last reason why central banks are likely to be ineffective is because in order to be able to implement some of these policies, you really need a very tight coordination between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy is from the central banks to the Federal Reserve, fiscal policy is through taxes. So you need a really tight, effective, speedy and efficient, well-oiled machine working between those two machines, monetary policy and fiscal policy for those policies to have any effect whatsoever. And as we have more and more of a political polarization, especially in a country like America, where we're deeply divided down the middle between the right and the left, it is unlikely that we will receive the type of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy in order to make those things effective. What is likely gonna happen is fiscal policy just takes way too long to be put into place, and by the time it does, the overreaction will be so severe that it will break things. All right, the next one, we are likely to see a negative return on cash and bonds, and this one is kind of, this one is kind of intuitive. We've seen yields globally go down and down and down and down. We already have about 16 to 17 trillion dollars in negatively yielding debt globally. And so there is a rush into safe haven assets right now, which means that the market is pricing in an expectation of negative returns. Now, usually a flight into safe haven assets like this, especially when there's a negative return, will result in a flight back out. And if there is a big sell-off in treasuries, especially by central banks around the world, the buyer of last resort is going to be the Federal Reserve, and that is done through money printing, and money printing to buy up treasuries is going to result in price inflation. I've covered that extensively in other videos as to why money printing to buy treasuries is basically debt monetization, which the eventual and direct result of that is going to be price inflation. It's not gonna be reflected in the CPI because the CPI doesn't reflect real inflation because of the way that the data is calculated and the categories that it excludes from the measurement from the index. Now this is accelerating globally because there's a war on physical cash around the globe because if you have physical cash, it's not subject to the fees and the government and the central bank can't control the money supply as effectively. And so you're gonna see more and more of a push away from physical cash. You can only use real bank accounts and that way the central banks can more effectively control the money supply and inflate the money and have the effect that they're looking for. Physical assets and physical cash are a hedge in an economy, in a system against inflation. And so the cost of living is gonna go up faster than your bank account interest is going to pay you and the interest on your bonds is going to pay you. So you're gonna have a negative return on both cash and bonds. Now, number five. Number five is the one that especially Americans do not like to hear and quite frankly, most Americans don't agree with. But one of the main influencing factors and driving forces of the next decade is almost certainly going to be the dynamic between China and America. In the last 500 years, the dynamic that we are currently experiencing globally between China and America has happened 16 times. That dynamic is when you have a ruling global power that is challenged by a rising power. Again, that has happened 16 times in the last 500 years. On average, that's once every 31 years. 12 of those times, historically, it has led to war. This is documented by Graham Allison in his book, it's a fantastic read if you want more information on this dynamic and what America and China are currently doing that is escalating the problem and it's not solving it. Now, the fact of the matter is that one of the reasons why America hasn't experienced a collapse of the proportion that some doomsdayers are predicting is because of the position that America has globally and how we can use the dollar around the world 
basically as a weapon. It is the world's reserve currency and so America holds a lot of power and is able to prevent a lot of the things that would take out countries with less power globally. And that is why the dynamic between China and America is so powerful. Because if China is able to displace America as the global ruling number one power in the world, that will severely diminish America's ability to use its position globally to prevent economic disaster. And I know everybody is thinking right now that could never happen. America's military is so much more powerful than anything. And that is true but our military is currently the only thing that we hold over the rest of the world. And not only that, China's military growth is expanding and growing at such an extraordinary pace that within the next eight to 10 years, their military will likely exceed America's in terms of strength, obviously unless there's a war, in which case who knows what will happen. The same dynamic happened between England and Germany back at the turn of the last century, and Germany was the rising power, and it did result in war. Great Britain had a massive advantage over Germany in terms of military power, and it did lead to war. And Great Britain was never the leading power in the world ever again. They won the war, and they decimated Germany in the process, but they took themselves out as well. So I'm not saying it's going to lead to war because obviously of the last 16 times in history, it's only led to war 12 times. So there are things that can be done to avoid that. And with today's technology, who knows what war would actually look like. It could very well look more like a cyber warfare rather than a shooting war. But that dynamic is still at play. And with their economy overtaking ours, and with more and more tension increasing between these two powers, it is almost a certainty that that dynamic and tension and power play is going to be one of the top driving factors in what the next decade looks like. Especially because we currently use our position at the top of the global heap as a way to prevent some of the economic catastrophe that we are long overdue for. And lastly, what we're likely to see over the next decade is a return on physical assets that greatly exceeds anything that we had in the last decade. If you've been around the channel at all, you know that obviously I'm referring to gold here, but I'm also referring to anything with intrinsic value, hard assets, real estate, food, commodities, utilities, anything that's consumable that has actual hard intrinsic value. Those things typically perform extremely well during times of economic catastrophe that is defined by inflation. And every Everything that I've spoken about over the course of this video shows that it does look like we are about to experience a time of inflation. So those are the six driving factors that it looks like will mark the next decade and things that we will experience and look back on as being the driving forces that influenced what the next decade unfolds like and what it looks like. The ineffectiveness of central banks, the growing wealth gap and political polarization, the dynamic of China as a rising power challenging the ruling power of America, the exodus of money out of assets in order to fund obligations both public and private, a negative return on cash and bonds, and a much higher return on alternative or physical hard assets. Let's dive into a couple questions that were very common in the comments section of the last video on the coming repo crisis. I guess I didn't make this clear enough, but the number one question was, was something to the effect of when is this gonna happen? This cash crunch that is coming is culminating on December 31st. It looks like it's gonna be building up over the next couple of weeks, and it looks like it will culminate at the turn of the year, December 31st. So when I talk about time frame in the next couple of days, it looks like it's building and building and building, and then that's when it will all kind of culminate. Now, like I said in the video, the Federal Reserve has pledged an additional few hundred billion dollars into the repo market to try and quell the liquidity issues. Doesn't look like that's gonna be enough, but we'll have to wait until after the turn of the year to see if that's actually gonna be effective. And so in January, I will do a follow-up video on the repo crisis to talk about what the fallout was, what it means, or whether or not it, it resulted in anything actually significant, which obviously I think it will, but ultimately we'll have to wait and see until the turn of the year. The second question that came up quite a bit was that it sounded like I was kind of speaking out of both sides of my mouth a little bit as far as the uh, the stock market and I'm talking about a collapse this December and I'm talking about an ultimate collapse next December but I'm also saying that asset prices could still rise uh, due to the quantitative easing and the Federal Reserve printing money so let me let me clarify I think short term we're gonna have some massive volatility and so we sh should see big corrections both this December and volatility throughout the year Ultimately, I think the stock market in terms of price can still go up even if value is going down because the dollar is falling extremely fast due to inflation and the purchasing power of your money. 
anything you measure in terms of that money is gonna look like it's going up. The stock market might be falling in terms of value, but if you measure it by a shrinking measuring stick, it's gonna look like it's growing. And so there's a very big distinction and a very big difference between price and value, especially when your measuring stick is shrinking along the way. And that's why I've been saying for a long time that it looks like cash is probably one of the most dangerous things to have because if bonds have a negative return, cash has an even more negative return because it doesn't actually pay you anything. And so if your choice is between bonds and stocks or even cash and stocks, probably better to be in stocks because even though you might have a massive correction or a crash, at least you still own equity in a company that long term can find a way to start making money again, find new markets and find a way to survive and you might have some dividends along the way as well. And the final question that seemed like it was coming up a lot was about cryptocurrencies and are cryptocurrencies a good hedge against inflation and the current havoc that we're seeing unfold in our current monetary system? The short answer is we don't know. The best predictor that you have of future events is history. And quite frankly, cryptocurrencies are just too new to be able to do any sort of historical analysis on how they will perform and what people will do with them in massive crises. We have lots of data and lots of history and lots of documentation to show what happens to fiat currencies, physical assets, precious metals, and equity in companies and debt like bonds in terms of crises both globally and locally. We don't have any data on cryptocurrencies. It may turn out that they do very well. We just don't have anything to look back on to say, hey, this is normally what happens to something like a cryptocurrency when something like this happens. So thank you so much for everybody participating, asking questions. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions or comments today on the content that I've talked about in the six driving factors for the next decade. Love to hear your thoughts. If you like the content, please like, please subscribe. All your support really does mean the world to me. Thank you so much for tuning in. You guys have a great day.